Next, on Lectures in History, University of Nevada, Las Vegas professor Michael Green teaches a class on Abraham Lincoln and the 1860 presidential election. He describes the political climate of the antebellum era, background on the other candidates, and the deliberations at the party conventions. Lincoln won the presidency over three other candidates with just under 40 percent of the popular vote. This class is about an hour and 15 minutes. Well, all right, so we got Lincoln's ancestors over here. We got him born, we got him moved around, we got him elected to office, we got him married. It's time to elect him president. So today we're going to look at the election of 1860 and using the term everybody's second choice, at the national convention that year in 1860, a Lincoln supporter sent a wire that said, I think he's going to win the nomination. He is the second choice of everybody. Well, Lincoln himself had a line, my name is new in the field, and I suppose I am not the first choice of a very great many. Our policy then is to give no offense to others. Leave them in a mood to come to us if they shall be compelled to give up their first love. I know, it kind of gets you right there. Giving up your first love. Well, okay, so the themes we're going to be talking about, and I'm also going to explain why there's suddenly a book cover in the upper corner. But first of all, Republicans showed they were not the Whig Party. They actually ran a very well-organized campaign. At the same time, there's an old saying in politics, if your opponent is imploding, don't do anything to stop him. In this case, there were some implosions on the part of the other parties involved. And we will get to those as we go along. We'll do a little bit of the background leading up to the 1860 election, and we'll talk a bit more about why slavery was a key issue both leading up to the election and then in the outcome. Now, this next one kind of might make you stop and think for a second, well, yeah, he, he was the guy who won the nomination in the election. Shouldn't he be doing a lot to win it? And the answer is yes. But at the same time, remember, in the 19th century, you did not openly campaign. A few people did, and it caused them problems. They were not supposed to do that. Well, Lincoln was not open about it, or at least too open about it. So he has to be careful, and he has to make sure it doesn't look like he's too far out in front. He can't afford to get out over his skis. I know the thought of Lincoln skiing really has some appeal. And finally, it's a modern election and a pre-modern election. It's modern in the sense that we're going to see the kinds of things that are designed to get people out to vote events, activities, and so on. You're going to see the media play an important role. At the same time, here's a way to think about it. We expect in presidential elections these days that it's possible there's a third party candidate who might get a little traction. But for the most part, we don't expect that. In 1860, we end up with four parties, basically, and all four are in one way or another viable. It's possible any of them could pull this off. That's not unusual. If you think back to the elections we've talked about, where in 1824, before it's really a popular election the way we'd see in 1860, there's more than two candidates. 1836, where the Whigs had put three candidates in the field hoping for lightning to strike. And you get, in 1844 and 48, third-party candidates. And then again in 1856, where they do have an impact. So today, if a third-party candidate suddenly ran in 2020, well, we'd be saying, wow, oh, this is different. Back then, oh, there's a third-party candidate. Big deal. We've been through this. 
This is boring. Let's move on. So in that, the spirit of what they were saying, let's move on. I have put this book cover up here in bold-faced 1860 because a century later, a reporter named Theodore H. White did a book called The Making of the President, 1960. And today, when you watch and read about politics and all of the personalities play such a role, and you often hear, oh, you know, Donald Trump, does he loves fast food. Barack Obama ate a lot of salad or whatever. The kinds of things we now find out about candidates are attributable in part to White treating this as a kind of novelistic story. It's nonfiction, but he wrote it beautifully, won the Pulitzer Prize. There's an element of this to 1860 as well. So we're going to look at the making of the president 1860. There are plenty of books on this subject, and most of them have come out in the last few years. Now, there, there could be a joke to be done here about whether my favorite historian is on the screen, and he is. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are other historians here, and I, I was thinking of uh, some guy's joke of a country singer who said, you know, you're asking who my favorite is. Well, they didn't put any taters on my plate. Well, somebody did, obviously. But in this case, there has been more attention, especially with the sesquicentennial and back in 2010 of this election, so that suddenly there's a lot more attention to how did this happen? Because Lincoln was a most unlikely victor. Republican Party's in its second election. He's never been on the national ballot. He's had one term in the House. How does he get there? So these books have tried to address that, some more successfully than others. I'm not too sure about this one. And... Uh, We'll try to address that today. So a little background, some reminders. The first time the Republican Party put a candidate in the field was in 1856 with John C. Fremont, for whom almost everything in Las Vegas is named, as we know. And, or if it is a name for him, he named it. Well, James Buchanan won, and the key for Republicans was that Buchanan carried Illinois, Indiana, and Pennsylvania. They were thinking, all right, Fremont didn't. If we can get those three states in particular, I mean, they'd like to spread out beyond that, but those three in particular being swing states, if they can get the right man in 1860, they have a chance. There's also the third party, the Know Nothings, the nativist party led by Millard Fillmore. Can Republicans outpace them, find a way to cut them off? And the answer is the Know Nothings kind of cut themselves off. They're anti-immigrant, but they're fighting over slavery. The Northern Know Nothings have a different position than the Southern Know Nothings, and Republicans are going to capitalize on that. Well, James Buchanan was elected. And one of the books about his administration suggests that he didn't do too well. Uh, when, when you, the book about you is called The Worst President, people say, well, gee. And people in Pennsylvania who are in Buchanan country would argue about this probably, and I can get into an argument about it myself. But Buchanan had a tough four years. The Dred Scott decision was incredibly controversial, as we know. And there are divisions in the Democratic Party that result from bleeding Kansas and the Dred Scott decision, where Stephen Douglas, that little giant who believes in popular sovereignty, takes the stand that popular sovereignty still stands despite Dred Scott. And what's going on in Kansas, where there's out-and-out -out warfare, is counter to what they're supposed to do in connection with popular sovereignty. And Buchanan and Douglas split over it. And Buchanan tries to get him defeated for re-election, without much success, obviously. Soon after Buchanan takes office, a panic breaks out. There's an economic depression or downturn. And let's face facts. The president who's in office when the economy goes south usually gets a lot of the blame for it. 
well, Buchanan had just been in office a little bit. You can't say he had done that much that quickly, but he's going to pay the price as well. It's also the case, uh, there's a book based on the old claim that the people who led to the Civil War were the blundering generation. The plundering generation in this story, Buchanan's administration was incredibly corrupt. The culmination of it is seen as when he has cabinet officials who are Southern sympathizers, Southerners themselves, who sympathize with secession, sending money and goods and arms into the South or helping the South get ready for the war. But there are a lot of questions about federal contracts, payoffs, that sort of thing. And Buchanan and the Democratic Party face a lot of allegations that they're up to no good, they're crooked. And then, as we're going to see, the slavery issue does not go away with the Dred Scott decision. John Brown's attempt to take over Harper's Ferry and start a slave rebellion or insurrection doesn't exactly work, but it certainly upsets a lot of people and gets a lot of people talking about the slavery issue, if they hadn't been already. And frankly, they should have been. They're certainly talking about it in Illinois in 1858. Douglas was running for his third term in the Senate. He's a national figure. And the Republican Party in Illinois did something that traditionally parties in Illinois didn't do. At the state convention, they endorsed their own candidate for the U.S. Senate, and it was Lincoln. Douglas knew from 20 years' experience how tough it was going to be to take on Lincoln. And the debates result when Lincoln just starts following him around Illinois, talking whenever Douglas finishes speaking, and finally they agree to a set of seven debates. And in the course of these debates, Lincoln is already getting some traction nationally. There are people who know him. He's gotten some votes in the 1856 Republican Convention for vice president. But in 1858, suddenly, he's rocketed to stardom. He's taking on Douglas. Douglas, for his part, wins re-election thanks to something we have all heard plenty about, gerrymandering. The 1850 legislative districts were still in effect in 1858, despite a lot of growth in Illinois. And Lincoln had to win far more seats than he technically should have to get elected. It turns out Lincoln won more legislative seats than Douglas in 1858. Remember, U.S. senators are elected by the legislature. And 100 were up, and Lincoln won 54 to 46. But Douglas had enough seats there to be able to hold on to his Senate seat. One night after the election, Lincoln is walking along. And Lincoln could be a bit of a klutz, I guess. Uh, It's one of the things I have to admire about him as a klutz. And as he was walking along, he tripped and he had trouble getting himself under control. And he thought to himself, it's a slip, not a fall. Well, he slipped. He didn't win this election. He was proud that he'd taken his stand. He was impressed that he did as well as he did. He felt he made a contribution to the debate. There's a debate among historians as to how much Lincoln was targeting 1860. And it's not just the question of, could he get elected president? That really wasn't the key thing. Could he head off Douglas, who seemed likely to be the Democratic nominee? Well, during the debates, Douglas said, almost in so many words, it's popular sovereignty, you vote on slavery, Dred Scott doesn't really matter. And for Southerners, and Southerners dominate the Democratic Party, This is not what they want to hear. And it is going to hurt Douglas nationally. And sometimes people attribute to Lincoln the extra motive or the awareness that he was going to cripple Douglas 
and his chances of winning in 1860. Well, hmm. I know that we all get tired of endless elections. It seems like they never end. The campaign for 2020 began the night after the 2016 election and so on. It's always been that way. And there's plenty going on in 1859, considered an off year. And if we're going to see Lincoln is up to a few things, we'll get to that. But there's a lot going on nationally that's going to affect where Lincoln is headed in 1860. The first is John Brown, remember, had been in Kansas. He goes to Virginia, attacks the Harper's Ferry Arsenal, or more actually takes it over, is thrown back out, put on trial for treason against the state of Virginia, convicted, and sentenced to be hanged. And Southerners are convinced this is all a Republican plot. The party's behind this. And there are a few Republicans, and some of them are abolitionists, not really affiliated with the Republicans, and they're not doing it from the standpoint of being members of the Republican Party anyway, who did help Brown. But most Republicans are taking the position, no, we don't go for the violent result. We are not in favor of what this guy did. Anybody here who uh, has lived up in the Bay Area? Lake Merced gets its moment in the sun. David Broderick was a senator from California and a Douglas man. Big Douglas supporter, big believer in popular sovereignty. Now remember when California came in the Union, the idea was it was going to be a free state vote with the northern free states. In fact, there were Southerners who came to California. Big surprise. The gold rush is just going to attract people from one part of the world. No, they're coming from everywhere. And there were plenty of Southern politicians in the area, and one of them was a lawyer named David Terry. And Terry and Broderick were rivals for power in California Democratic politics. And remember, there's a bit of that Southern Honor Code and the Code Duello. Lincoln almost got into a duel. Andrew Jackson fought a duel every second Tuesday of the month or whatever he was doing. Well, in this case, they fight a duel at Lake Merced, and Terry shoots Broderick and kills him. A lot of the country has no idea. It's out in California. There's no TV coverage. Nobody texts from the duel. Did you see what Terry did? But it is certainly noticeable to politicians and opinion makers. And it reminds them, just like the beating, the caning of Charles Sumner, this is a violent issue. And by the way, since we're in Nevada, I have to mention this. David Terry later is still practicing law in California. And he ends up in a case against a mining and banking magnate named William Sharon, who basically controlled the Comstock load. And Sharon had had a mistress, and there was a big legal fight over whether he had agreed to marry the mistress or had they married under the common law, what have you. They wind up in court. And the first time the ruling goes against the mistress, she pulls a gun. The next time the ruling goes against her, she pulls a knife and her attorney, Terry, pulls the gun. Later, after they've lost the case, they're on the train, bump into the judge, a Supreme Court justice, who was hearing the case, and Terry punches the justice. So the justice's bodyguard shoots and kills Terry. And there were people in California at the time who said it took 25 years, but David Broderick finally got even. Well, I don't know if Mr. Broderick would have been that thrilled, but at the very least, it was a violent year. Doing okay? Okay. 
what we're going to do is take a look at the other campaigns and candidates. Then we'll get to the Republicans, what Lincoln's up to. Logically, 1860 is going to be a tough year for the Democrats. Buchanan is not wildly popular. Northern and Southern Democrats are divided. Douglas is the clear front runner. There are a few other people whose names pop up, but it's Douglas. And he's controversial. He is bound to run into some problems, and he did. So we have the one real candidate. His real problem at the convention is that under the rules, two-thirds of the delegates needed to vote for him or for any other nominee. Where this gets kind of weird, if you think about it, is that Douglas considers himself the ideal Democrat, lowercase d. Popular sovereignty is the classic case. Vote on slavery. Well, even Lincoln makes a comment at one point along the lines of two-thirds doesn't really sound all that democratic. Shouldn't it be like 50% plus one? Well, yeah, and it's designed to unite the party. As it turns out, it's going to help divide the party. So the Democrat has a problem with democracy. And the other problem they run into, I mean, there are plenty, but the convention is held in Charleston, South Carolina. How many of you have been to Charleston, South Carolina? Okay. Have, have you been in the late spring, early summer? Humid? Just a little. Just a little. Uh, or as somebody said of a southern city that gets humid, the bugs are twin engine jobs. I mean, these are, uh, it gets a little warm. It's warm and sticky. There's no air conditioning. It's 1860. There's no deodorant. There's nothing like that. Everybody is hot and unhappy. What's more, the South does not have as much railroad construction as the North. Getting to Charleston requires a bunch of changes of train. So it's a tough trip. It's hard for them to get there. So then they finally get there. It's warm and humid. And then they're going to fight over who they're going to nominate. So they're in trouble. Now, Lincoln has a theory. And his idea is, here's what the Democrats should do if they really want to stick it to Douglas. Nominate him on the platform he opposes. Say, we're for Dred Scott and we nominate Douglas. And then Douglas has to say, well, he, he's for it or against it. He has to take a position. And if he has any principle, he'll say, I can't run on that. If he has no principle, he'll offend everybody. And Lincoln once said of Douglas something along the lines of, uh, he does seem to lie more than just about any other man I know. So he is not a fan of his, and Douglas is not a fan of Lincoln, but he's an admirer. And Douglas wants the nomination, the convention divides, and it finally breaks up. So they try again. And this time, they try it in Baltimore which is a little easier to get to. No offense to Charleston, South Carolina. It's a lot easier to get to today. The Northern Democrats get together there. The Southern Democrats will have nothing to do with it, for the most part. And they nominate Douglas. And the convention ends up choosing, as his running mate, a guy from Georgia named Herschel Johnson. Now, many, many years ago, when I had no life, as opposed to now when I have no life, I memorized the vice presidents. What else did I have to do? Herschel Johnson didn't get there. And not many people really wanted to be vice president. In this case, Douglas's choice was actually Alexander Stevens, 
who was a far more prominent politician, like Johnson A. Georgian, and Stevens did not want to be vice president. And he proved how much he hated the vice presidency by becoming the vice president of the Confederacy and spending four years fighting with Jefferson Davis. So Stevens might have been fun as a vice president for the Union, too. Whatever it was, he was going to be in a fight about it. So the idea is, okay, Douglas is the northern popular sovereignty guy. Johnson is willing to accept it. He's a southerner. It balances the ticket. Today, we don't think much about that in terms of geographic balance. In the 19th century in particular, it mattered a lot. So the Southern Democrats say, okay, we're not nominating Douglas. They go with the sitting vice president of the United States, John Breckinridge. Trivia break. John Breckinridge was elected vice president when he was 35. Youngest man ever elected to the presidency or vice presidency, in this case the vice presidency. So if he'd been elected, he would have been by far the youngest president ever. He was Buchanan's vice president, so he is split with Douglas, who in fact he had once been at least a quasi-ally, if not an ally. And Breckinridge runs on the platform of Dred Scott is fine. We want a slave code for the territories, bring your slaves. And the irony is Breckinridge is from the upper south. He's from Kentucky, where the feelings about slavery aren't quite so deep as they are in the lower south. For Breckinridge's running mate, you want to talk about geographic diversity. They choose a guy named Joseph Lane, who's from South Carolina and lives in Oregon. They're getting everything in this one. They've got the South, they've got the Upper South, they've got the Far West. And by the way, there are only a few thousand voters in Oregon. They don't really think of Lane as a guy who's going to carry a bunch of states for them. But he's definitely from the Lower South. He's definitely pro-slavery. They figure he's a good man to have on the ticket. He also does not look happy about being the vice presidential nominee. I just, he wanted something better. I don't know. If you like a party, we have lots of parties. <laughs> Another party forms, and also in May 1860, like the Democrats, like the Republicans, they have their convention. And they call themselves the Constitutional Union Party. A lot of old former Whigs, a good number of Know Nothings. The Know Nothing Party is pretty well collapsed by 1860. Where are they going to go now if they don't want to be a Democrat or a Republican? And you find a good number of southern and border state pro-slavery people. John Bell, who's in the lower left, was one of the few southerners who had opposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He's one of those rarities. He's a politician from Tennessee who both was close to Andrew Jackson, then an enemy of Andrew Jackson, and didn't get shot for it. I don't know how Jackson let him off the hook. Sam Houston, the governor of Texas. John Crittenden was a Kentucky politician considered the protege of Henry Clay. We're looking for a compromise. We're looking for a way to meet in the middle. Crittenden's your man. And the group included, yes, other northern former Whigs, not too excited about the slavery issue, Edward Everett had been a professor, a diplomat, a U.S. senator. And uh, a few years after this, 
he would become one of those great historical trivia questions. They were dedicating this veteran cemetery at Gettysburg. And they invited the man they considered the great orator of the era. He knew his Latin, he knew his Cicero, he knew his great Romans and all this. And he gave a two-hour speech to hail the dedication of the veteran cemetery at Gettysburg. And then somebody else got up, talked for two minutes, and he's the one we remember. For what it's worth, Everett wrote to Lincoln after this, if I could have captured in my two hours how perfectly you captured things in two minutes, I really would have done a good job. Well, the Unionists, the Constitutional Unionists, choose Bell and Everett, both in their mid to late 60s, and I'm hoping you don't think I'm making fun of age when I say this, but bear in mind, life expectancy back then. They are much older. Today, people in their mid and late 70s are talking about running for president. Back then, you didn't hear that. And their platform was uh, the union as it is and the Constitution as it is, which um, I think we can think of as the kind of, shh, don't talk about it platform. If we don't talk about the problem, it will go away. By the way, to tell you the rest of the course, it didn't go away. The course is now over. We don't have to continue. We know how it comes out, right? We also know how this is going to come out, but how do we get there? Okay, so the Constitutional Unionists have their ticket of Bell and Everett, Southern Democrats, Breckinridge and Lane, Northern Democrats, Douglas and Johnson. Thank you, Harper's Weekly, for doing fine artwork. I know this looks like one of those cable TV panel discussions. 16 different people having a conversation. So this is prominent candidates for the Republican presidential nomination at Chicago from photographs by Brady. Matthew Brady's around even before the war starts. And when they were coming to Chicago for the Republican convention in May 1860, it was pretty well agreed the front runner was William Henry Seward. And he's in the middle, and he's got the biggest portrait, so he must be the most important one. He's got a problem. Well, he's got several problems. One of them is he's prominent. People know where he stands. He's one of those guys where he can't undo it. He can't say, well, I said that here and that there. You know, I, I meant it both ways. And he has said, there's a higher law than the Constitution. There's an irrepressible conflict between slavery and freedom. And Southerners just look at him as this radical, wild-eyed guy who they cannot support. But so do a lot of Republicans. There are plenty of conservative Republicans, moderate Republicans. They know he's too far out there. He's got another problem. We had talked before about Thurlow Weed, his political manager, and Weed being involved in manipulating the New York legislature. Well, the Buchanan administration is known for corruption, among other things. So if Republicans run Seward and say, we oppose corruption, Democrats are going to say, uh, you? you? You oppose corruption. You, you really think you're going to sell that one? You got sewered from the corrupt machine in New York. How can you possibly pull that off? Another thing is, Weed had a bright idea. Get Seward out of the line of fire and away from the issues. So Seward went to Europe for eight months in 1859 and did the Grand Tour. So everybody else is sitting around figuring out how they're going to be president, and Seward is running around Europe. Well, yeah, he's not here to make sure that his forces are going to be ready and behind him. Now, then you, you go out from Seward, and the other most radical Republican under consideration is Salmon Chase, who is a former Democrat from Ohio. Well, Seward's a former Whig who's a radical, so the Democrats aren't sure about Seward. 
Chase is a former Democrat, so the former Whigs aren't too sure about him. And there's a political advisor to Chase who says, look, if they're not going to take Seward because he's too radical, they're not going to take you. Okay, so then you go up to the top above Chase, and that's Edward Bates, who is a lawyer from Missouri, a former Whig and know nothing. He'd freed his slaves. He didn't talk much about what he thought of slavery. And there's a group of Republicans who say, yeah, he's conservative. He's really conservative. We need a real conservative. We'll scare away people if we nominate somebody who's been vocal about being anti-slavery. Better to kind of just slip someone in there. Now, back then, as I say, you didn't campaign. Bates wouldn't even talk about it. Getting Bates to do anything to help himself get elected was impossible. So he really doesn't have any kind of organization to help him out. Now, the rest of these people on here, I mean, John Fremont is on there, and he'd done it in 1856. They're not doing it again. And there's an abolitionist, Cassius Clay. Well, he's not going to get it if Seward isn't. There's a Supreme Court Justice, John McLean. There are some favorite sons where, you know, you choose someone from your state. Pennsylvania has Simon Cameron. And then down below, just sort of hanging out, not saying or doing too much, we have Lincoln. Sort of on the periphery. Not exactly in your face. Lincoln isn't getting in anybody's grill. I don't want you to think Lincoln ever said, I'm not getting in anybody's grill. Hey. Well, yeah, he's not in your face, but he's circling you. Lincoln was plotting a lot from 1858 to 60 in terms of his possibilities running for president. Right after he lost the election to Douglas. A couple of small newspapers, one in Illinois, one in Ohio, announced they supported him for president. And Lincoln called them off. He said, no, 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 I don't think I'm worthy of that, and it's too early to talk about it. Supposedly, he's on a train one time, and he says, my wife thinks I'm going to be president. Can you imagine a sucker like me being president? And people thought he meant, when they look back at it, sucker, oh, you know, someone who falls for something. Actually, it was a term used to describe Illinoisans. So he's an Illinoisan. He's, it's not that he's easily taken. But he knew very well, if he were to pull this off, everything had to go right. And he does what he can to make it go right. That's the important thing here. Seward may have gone to Europe and let weed worry about things. Chase is trying to get everybody to support him. Bates is doing nothing. For his part, Lincoln does a bunch of things. One of them is he sets to work making sure that a volume of the debates is published. He wants a book out there with his name on it, making his arguments. Have any of you ever noticed that almost everybody now who runs for president has a book out that they did not write? Well, I shouldn't say that. That they probably didn't write. And they're talking about how they you know, were all born in a log cabin they built by themselves. They walked five miles uphill both ways in the snow to get to school, all the stuff you have to do to get elected. Well, Lincoln isn't quite doing that, but his name's going to get out there. He also spends a lot of 1859, granted he's practicing law, he's keeping busy, he goes around making speeches, not overtly campaigning for president, sometimes not even overtly political, but he's keeping himself out there. 
He's making sure people know who he is and that he's a loyal Republican. And he is the guy who almost beat Douglas and technically did, if not for the gerrymandering. Occasionally he gets a request, could you come speak here? And he sends a public letter that they read and they all applaud him. But it's him. They know he's out there. As he's doing this, he gets an invitation to speak in Brooklyn, New York in early 1860. He's going to speak at the Plymouth Church where the minister was Henry Ward Beecher, a major figure at the time as a minister, as a reformer, an anti-slavery man. And he realizes, I'm going to New York. I'm going to be in the big city. He gets a new suit. And he's going to be giving this speech. He didn't like to wing it too much, but he did write things out. He spends weeks in the state library in Illinois researching. And it turns out the speech is moved to the Cooper Union, the building in this slide, in New York City. And he is now invited to speak by an organization of young Republicans led, in, among others, by the editor of the New York Evening Post, a loyal Republican named William Cullen Bryant, one of the young Republicans there, pictured next to Lincoln. I guess Republicans were older then. I don't know. Um, well, here's the thing. Bryant was involved. Horace Greeley was involved. There were young Republicans involved. And what the organization really should have been called was the club to find a Republican other than Seward. Greeley had once been very close to Seward, hated him because Seward did not support his political ambitions. Bryant was a former Democrat, didn't trust Seward in the least. And other New Yorkers who feel Seward is too corrupt or he's a fake radical, he's not really that anti-slavery, they're looking for a candidate. Lincoln goes to give a speech. And Harold Holzer, who I think is publishing about his 52nd book on Lincoln, and I think I have most of them. I don't have room for any more books. I don't have any more room for books for by Harold Holzer. But he published a book on the Cooper Union speech, calling it the speech that made Lincoln president. And there's a lot to be said for that. He's on the national stage, New York, the biggest city then and now, and he makes a great impression. He gives a very literate, historical speech. And they kind of look at him and say, we thought he was this Westerner who, who was ugly and sounded weird and uh, didn't really know what he was talking about, and he, he seems to have it together. It doesn't guarantee him the nomination, but it's an important step on that road. He goes on to speak in New England afterward. And he was actually visiting his son, Robert, who was in school in New England. But he also was speaking there. And it's kind of funny. Allegedly, Robert was nervous about his father being there because he didn't think his father was that cultured and cultivated. And all of Robert's friends loved him. Well, he was this great guy. What's your problem, Bob? Well, when he goes back home, he's had maybe just a moment in the sun there. But there are things going on to help him. And yes, he does have somebody who thinks he should be president. And Mary certainly encourages the idea. And I'm being a bit ironic by putting a photo of Norman Judd next to her because she hated Norman Judd. But Judd was the chairman of the Illinois Republican Party. And Lincoln corresponds with Judd. And he says, you know, I, I appear to be a candidate. I'm not too far in, and not a lot of people are all out for me, but I'm, I'm getting there. And it's my understanding that you're going to vote on where the convention will be. And I think it might help me if it's in Illinois. 
And when they have the National Committee meeting, and we still have Democratic and Republican National Committees, and they vote on these things, and they make big decisions. It turns out Chicago beat St. Louis by one vote to host the convention. It's Judd's vote. Where this will end up being valuable, first of all, if you go to a sports book, home field advantage is worth a few points. Lincoln has home field advantage. And what they're going to do is stack the galleries, as they call it. So what they're going to do is give tickets out to people who will come yell for Lincoln. So the people on the floor of the convention who are voting are going to say, wow, listen to all that. They love Lincoln. And it may have been Judd, it may have been somebody else. They hired a couple of professional screamers. Where every now and then, if it got a little too quiet, somebody would bellow Lincoln's name at the top of his lungs, and everybody would start cheering for Lincoln again. It's sort of like having the laugh track on a TV show. You know, you've got to have something to remind you to laugh. We have neat people to remind us to yell. And Judd, having connections as a prominent Illinoisan, is able to get some discounts to help people come to Chicago. By the way, uh, it also turns out that the mayor of Chicago hated Judd. So one of the problems Lincoln runs into in Illinois is getting everybody on the same page. They all tend to like him, but getting them around their own hatreds is a bit of a problem. And the mayor of Chicago at the time of the convention, just to get at Judd, ordered a raid of the local brothels. It is going to shock you to know that some of the delegates got into trouble. And we'll leave it at that. First, Lincoln needs to get through the state convention. And the goal is for the state of Illinois to endorse Lincoln. The meetings held in Decatur, Illinois, in early May of 1860. And Lincoln is at the convention. And you may have noticed this reference in Joshua Schenck's book that you're reading about how he, he didn't seem that happy or excited. He was kind of melancholic at the time. Well, things would change. One of the Republicans decided if Lincoln's going to win, he needs to appeal to the masses. He's now a lawyer, a middle-class businessman. How do we make him look better? So at the convention, they get a couple of people who come in, and one of them is a distant cousin of Lincoln named John Hanks. Now, at this convention, when they announce Lincoln's name, they pick him up and hand him over one another, passing him above their heads, which is why this is the marker in Decatur. I don't know that Lincoln felt that comfortable, but okay. Anyway, he's up front. Here comes John Hanks with somebody else carrying some rails and he's saying, Lincoln split those rails. Now, Lincoln is already known as an honest man. That's important to him. And he knows very well those rails could have come from anywhere. And he says something like, well, those, those look like some rails I might have split. Mm -hmm. And out of that experience with Cousin John bringing in the rails, he becomes known as the rail splitter candidate. And suddenly, he's not just the rising lawyer, he's a laboring man. And laboring men have more appeal politically than guys who sit there doing wills and trusts and arguing cases. He gets the nomination of the state convention. They unanimously agree. Allegedly, there's one guy who stands up and yells for Chase and they throw him out of the hall. They're not putting up with that. And the following week, they're going to meet in Chicago in mid-May 1860. Now these are left to right. So at the top, Davis, Sweat, Corner. At the bottom, Oglesby, Browning, Herndon.
there's no Thurlow Weed in this group. There's not the one guy who stands out for Seward. Davis is essentially the manager. He was the judge in the Eighth Circuit. He's the most respected one. Sweat is a close ally of his. They're both old Whigs. Corner is a recent German immigrant. And remember, we mentioned in connection with the Know Nothing Party, the number of immigrants coming to the U.S. in the 1850s, Germans were among them. And Lincoln, in fact, helped to finance a German paper for the Republican Party. And Corner is there to help him with the German delegates and the delegates from areas where there's a significant German population. Oglesby is the guy who found the rail, or at least found the guy who found the rail. He's going to be around. Orville Browning, you remember the letter Lincoln wrote about the woman he thought he might have been engaged to and might have married and all that. Well, that was Browning's wife to whom he wrote the letter. And Browning is a conservative Whig who, in fact, was supporting Bates. And when somebody said to him, hey, Browning is for Bates, Lincoln said, Bates will have no show and Orville will be for me. And when he is, he'll help us with the Bates men. And he did. Herndon is Lincoln's law partner. And have you ever um, had someone around you where you wanted to keep them quiet at a certain time? In my house, it's usually me who they, they want to keep quiet. Uh, that's Herndon. He's an abolitionist. He's very opinionated. And he really wants to be involved. And Lincoln's response is, we have so much legal work, Billy. Do all the legal work for me. I have a lot to do. In a sense, he puts Herndon on the shelf. Yeah, Herndon's writing to his fellow abolitionists. Yeah, that helps Lincoln. But he doesn't want Herndon out there making speeches at this time. So when they meet in Chicago in mid-May, Davis, in particular, is the leader of Lincoln's gang. They meet in a building expressly built for the convention that was called the Wigwam. And it's a bit crowded, and it's a bit busy, and in the hall and in the hotel rooms nearby, that's where the action's going to be. That's where things are going to get done. Today, a nominating convention meets, almost always everything's in place beforehand. In 1860, it's a different matter. Most conventions went a few ballots. So when they meet, Judd pulls off a wonderful maneuver. So back in 08, when Barack Obama was nominated, I'm watching The Daily Show. And they do a story, or they, uh, the net, one of the networks did a story that they showed about how the delegations are moved according to who the nominee is. Now, I'd never realized until that moment. Obama's from Illinois. They put the Illinois delegation down front. Biden's from Delaware. They put the Delaware delegation down front. Turns out, 2016, Clinton's from New York, Kane from Virginia, they're down front. Trump's from New York, Pence is from Indiana, they're down front. Well, they organize the floor a certain way. And Judd organizes the floor, and he does it in a very interesting way. He puts Illinois on one side, surrounded by all the states Lincoln needs to win and has a chance to win. Indiana doesn't have a favorite son, really. Pennsylvania is up in the air. Meanwhile, New York is Weed and Seward. They're on the other side of the hall, surrounded by their own people. If Thurlow Weed wants to go talk to the Indiana delegation, and I don't know exactly where they are in relation to this, but basically he's got to get from here down to here. And meanwhile, before he can get there, Davis has them next to him. It matters. It's going to have a big impact that they can be leaning over to each other during this. Hey, have you noticed so-and-so isn't doing to it? You ought to think about it. 
Well, Davis's master plan was Lincoln must establish himself as the challenger to Seward. Seward, everybody knows, is the front runner. They don't think he has the votes to win it on the first ballot, and he doesn't. He's not even close. Make Lincoln the obvious alternative. They sell the idea Lincoln's from the West, Seward's from the East. Which states do you need to win? Illinois, out West. Indiana, out West. Seward's from the East. You got the East. The Indiana delegation includes a Whig, Caleb Smith, who served with Lincoln in Congress. And the Indiana delegation talks, well, should we put up old Caleb as a favorite son? No, they decide we'll go for Lincoln. Davis wants to get another big delegation, and Indiana's the one he gets. So at the end of the first ballot, he wanted Lincoln to have 100 votes. Lincoln has 102. Seward's at about 173. He's at least 100 short. And as they're doing this, they're all running back and forth. And the claims that are being made, half of them are claiming Lincoln has agreed to be vice president. Half of them are claiming Lincoln's already got the nomination. Some of those who think he's got the nomination agree that he's giving up. The, I mean, they just don't know what's going on. And for the second ballot, Davis and company realize we need to make a big splash. Now, when they were going to the convention, Lincoln stayed home. That's what you did then. You didn't go if you were the candidate. And Lincoln said something like, I am too much of a candidate to go and not enough of a candidate to stay home. But he stays home. And any instructions? And he says, uh, for Seward, uh, if anybody asks, I'm with him on the irrepressible conflict, but not the higher law. Irrepressible conflict might sound a little like a house divided against itself. That's okay. Higher law, no. I'm an old Henry Clay tariff man. He says, make no contracts that bind me. And Davis and Sweat get a hold of a Whig from, old Whig from Pennsylvania named Joseph Casey, who works in the political operation of Simon Cameron, the state's political boss. And they meet with him. And what happens is not entirely clear. When the meeting was done, Sweat allegedly turned to Davis, I'm pretty sure it was Sweat, and said, Lincoln may, said, make no contracts that bind me. Davis said, Lincoln ain't here. That's another reason you don't go. Your friends can make deals. Cameron may have been offered a cabinet seat. Pennsylvania definitely was. And that's not a big deal. Pennsylvania always got a cabinet seat in those days. To say Pennsylvania is going to be in the cabinet is nothing. But clearly, some kind of deal was made when it was done, and the meeting was over, and Davis came out, and there were some reporters, and one of them said, uh, did you... Uh, well, what what you do? And he said, well, we, we got them. And how'd you get them? And he said, by paying their price. Well, years later, Davis was asked, maybe it wasn't years, it was afterward. He was asked, they say you prevaricated. He said, we didn't prevaricate, we lied like hell. If you look up prevaricate in the dictionary, which Davis should have done, that's what he did. <laughs> On the second ballot, Lincoln is just a few votes behind Seward. And on the third ballot, delegations start swinging over to Lincoln until finally he's within just a few votes. The Ohio delegation puts him over, and one of Seward's supporters moves to make it unanimous. And when they realize what has happened, two men in the hall burst out crying. Thurlow Weed, who realizes he's blown it for Seward, and David Davis, who can't believe he pulled it off.
help came from other directions. On the guy on the left is Joseph Medill, who was a founder of the Chicago Tribune. On the right is Horace Greeley, founder of the New York Tribune. Uh, you'll spend some more time with Greeley when Dr. Borchard comes in here. Medill and his partners were writing editorials constantly saying, Lincoln's your man, go with Lincoln. Greeley, here's an example of how crazy things could be at a convention. Greeley was determined to get on the convention floor and do everything he could to stop Seward. He managed to get himself made a delegate from Oregon. Now, Greeley is the guy who actually did not say, but is credited with saying, go west, young man. For this convention, he really went west. Got as far west as Illinois and became an Oregonian. As it turned out, somebody stuck a Seward button on him that he didn't realize he had on. But Greeley is going through the crowd, just working them up against Seward, and he is just thrilled he's been able to help with this. Metal and his people are thrilled they've been able to help their local guy. So now we have a candidate, Abraham Lincoln, and he has to have a running mate. And again, usually the convention shows the running mate. And balance, we've got Abraham Lincoln of Illinois, Hannibal, Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. Can't get more balanced than that. Way out in New England. What's more, Lincoln's a former Whig. Hamlin is a former Democrat. Hamlin is close to being considered a radical Republican if he isn't in fact one. Lincoln, the moderate. Almost immediately after the convention, Lincoln writes to Hamlin and says, well, I will take the first step and introduce myself. How does it look? And they end up corresponding during the campaign. And from the nomination in mid-May of 1860 to November, yeah, there's a campaign. And Lincoln is going out of his mind. First, because everybody wants a piece of him. He is getting letters by the bushel. He's getting requests to speak. And he's, he'd love to, but he knows he can't. He knows he's not supposed to. Now, maybe he just knows they'd misspell his name. I don't know. I always got a kick out of that. I have, I have that hanging at home. It's like, people, get the guy's name right. Abram Lincoln. Who? And I mean, they've also got him kind of tilted. So as we consider, here are the four, their positions on slavery, and we've been talking about that with leave it alone or popular sovereignty or stop the spread of slavery. Lincoln goes to work as a political manager. And this is important to remember about him. He's a lawyer. That's how he makes his living. He is a politician. He has spent his life running for office. And we've been studying that. But... For the fun of it, I'm just going to say it. He runs in 32, he runs in 34, 36, 38, 40, 42. He lays out trying to find a way to get to Congress. They work out the deal for rotation in office. He helps them run in 44. He runs in 46. He's campaigning in 48. There's not much happening in 50 and 52. Then suddenly, 54, run for the legislature. 55, run for the Senate. 58, he's up for the Senate. He knows how to run for office. He's done it a lot. And from his little bivouac in Springfield, he's had a little office in the state capitol, he is writing letters back and forth and trying to gain support, find out what's going on, broker disputes. He's doing what he can to help himself. Now, it's a nasty campaign. It gets a little tiresome when we hear, oh, gee, campaigns today are so nasty. It's just that there are more ways to see and hear the nastiness. They're all tearing at the fabric of the country. Democrats are claiming that Lincoln and the Republicans believe in black equality. And they even have a parade in New York City where they suggest that Horace Greeley is basically 
close to having sexual relations with an African-American woman on a parade float. We don't have photos of that. Now, the day he was notified of winning the nomination, Lincoln was out playing a form of handball. And since it is our national pastime, we do have to have a word for baseball. But they're also very concerned about the uh, skunk at the garden party. And Lincoln is going to hit a home run. Uh, there are people who are critical of Stephen Douglas, too. Don't want you to think Douglas is just criticizing people. And Lincoln is charging the castle, and it's not clear here whether Buchanan's trying to pull Breckinridge in or wants Breckinridge to pull him out. We know Douglas has keys and Bell is blocking for him. Well, during the campaign itself, one of the problems that comes up is that there are four candidates. And in the course of the campaign, it becomes clear that there are essentially two races going on. In the North, it's Lincoln versus Douglas. In the South, it's Breckinridge versus Bell. Most Southerners do not want Douglas because they don't want popular sovereignty. They want protection for slavery. Now let's face facts. If they don't want Douglas because he's allowing a vote on slavery, they sure don't want Lincoln. And the irony is, Bell's from Tennessee, which is considered upper south. Breckinridge is Kentucky, which is more upper. And yet, Bell is the one more for compromise, or at the very least trying to tamp down the issue, than Breckinridge is. They do the things in the campaign that they can do to excite interest. There are songs. Each campaign has its song books. There are clubs. This organization, the Wide Awakes, was a group of young men who kind of formed a paramilitary organization, for lack of a better term, and they held these meetings dressed in uniforms or costumes and marched around. And their whole point was they were wide awake, they were young, they were active. As opposed to all these other people who when it came to the campaign were... And they excite a lot of interest for the party. Now, in the 19th century, Politics, remember, was much more of a social activity than we think of it today. Today, there are so many other things that people can do. Back then, no, we can't DVR the election or whatever. They're going to go out, they're going to do things, they're going to have fun. There was a guy who was writing about this subject and pointed out that if only we would have pizza parties, we might get more people interested in politics. I would be interested in the pizza party. I don't know about the politics. Yeah, I'd definitely be into the politics. So they're out getting people interested in the election and in voting. Republicans also work very hard to lower the temperature where they can. What happened in Illinois happened nationally. In Illinois, you had infighting in Lincoln's circle, between old Whigs and old Democrats, Northern Illinoisans and Southern Illinoisans, they agreed on one thing. They wanted to help Lincoln. So they tried where they could to put that to rest. But in other states, there are fights going on. In New York, weed is battling Greeley and vice versa. In Pennsylvania, Cameron's political machine is trying to stop another group of Republicans led by a guy named Andrew Curtin who's running for governor. So the Cameron people are kind of stuck with it. Well, Lincoln and David Davis and some of his allies, they're writing letters. Davis at one point does a tour and meets with Weed, meets with other New Yorkers, goes to Pennsylvania, meets with these people, all as part of an effort to make sure they keep their eye on the ball. The ball, in this case, is electing Lincoln. 
and putting aside whatever their personal issues are. You knew this was the outcome, right? Yeah. It's, I, I was doing my best to keep, it, uh, keep the suspense going here. Okay, so Lincoln wins. All right. It does indeed end up being Lincoln and Douglas in the north, Breckinridge and Bell in the south. And Breckinridge wins the lower south with his argument for a slave code. Bell wins the upper south where there is less of that commitment to protecting slavery at all costs. And Lincoln just stomps Douglas across the country, sort of. He easily beats Douglas in the Electoral College. Lincoln ends up with 180 electoral votes. Douglas has 12. But in fact, in a lot of the states, they ran pretty close. A couple of things to think about in connection with this. One, If Douglas, Buchan uh, Breckinridge, and Bell had gotten together, would they have beaten Lincoln? Well, the three of them together got 123 electoral votes to Lincoln's 180. So that's not enough. But would the votes have gone to Lincoln instead of to Douglas or the fusion candidate, as they were talking about it? Hard to say. We really can't know. Here's pretty much what we do know. There were efforts for them to get together. There were efforts to try to get a coalition together, and the one who blocked it was Douglas. He was not going to let the Democratic Party go in that direction. And at one point they said, well, the election could be thrown into the House, and Douglas said, I will help elect Lincoln before I let that happen. And when Douglas realized he was going to lose, there were a few votes that went the Republicans' way in October, he said, Lincoln is the next president, I'm going to the South. And he went south and he made speeches attacking secession. He was aware of what might come. Another way to look at this, the two candidates who got the most electoral votes were the two most radical candidates. The strongly anti-slavery guy, Lincoln, and the strongly pro-slavery guy, Breckinridge. We often hear about a desire for compromise. And at one time it was easier to compromise. Those are the two ends of the spectrum. It's not too easy to compromise. Well, Lincoln wins when he finds out in Springfield in November 1860 on that Tuesday night. Uh, he's very happy, but he isn't jumping around and all excited about it. And finally he said, well, I, there's a little lady at my house who's more interested in this than I am. I'd better go tell her. He goes home, and the rumor is, because he got home after 10, he was locked out. <laughs> Mary had said, no, 10 o'clock's the limit. Well, that's debatable. The next day, he saw some reporters, and he said, well, boys, your troubles are over. Mine have just begun. A few weeks later, South Carolina seceded over the election of Abraham Lincoln. We know how that's going to come out, too, but we're still going to end up talking about it. So we elected him today. The least we can do is secede next time. So we'll see you next time. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.